It's been a minute since we've had a saint join the show. Will Lutz was kind enough to join us and take us through a little clinic on kicking. We embarrass ourselves, as you can imagine, so stick around for that. But first, we get into some contract talks. Who's leading in the Saints on that list? Who are the top four? Where does Cam Jordan sit? Who is in contract extension talks? We're gonna get into all of that from the lovely PJs. And on like usual, as Brooke said, we are not coming to you from the Better Call Botto podcast studio, but we are here at PJ's. They have the best coffee in all of the world, if you ask me. That's my saying, not theirs. Come check them out, start your day with them. That's what we do because they get us fueled and going every single day. And like I said, we aren't in the Better Call Botto podcast studio, but if you need legal help with any of the following, car wrecks, offshore injuries, 18-wheeler collisions, Maritime and Jones Act, you better call Botto at 504-323-7777 or 985-303-7777 for your free consultation and case review, bottolaw.com. And check out Ideal Market. They are the home of the largest selection of international foods in the whole entire state. They do great things for the community, so much so that they've won awards for the stuff they do in the community. Go up there, get a hot plate. They're excellent, better than a lot of restaurants that you can find. And if you need to send a check, buy your money, do anything else, cash a check, check out their customer service center. It is unrivaled by anywhere else that you can find. And we are also sponsored by Hard Hide Punch of Tool Strawberry Whiskey. That is an 86 proof blend of aged wheat bourbon american light whiskey and fresh ponchatoula strawberries it's not for the thin skinned look for it in your favorite stores bars and restaurants and while you're out and about go check out firehouse subs veteran boulevard location great people doing great things for the community let's get into the show Welcome back to another episode on New Orleans Football, presented by PJ's Coffee, and that is why we are on location today, 2600 Airline Drive-In. We're hoping to be out here throughout the season and kind of get out to PJ's Coffee, show them some love since they show us love, so you guys show them some love. It's kind of that slow part of the season, but I think some fans forget everybody's in town, at least for the most part. What for fans who don't know, because obviously we're not, just because we're not out at practice or we're not at OTAs, doesn't mean things aren't happening. I mean, all the guys are at one hotel, right? You yeah. guys give us a description of what that's like? Yeah, they, they basically put them in a hotel, usually somewhere near the airport, and they're just all in there. And they do that again in training camp, too, until basically right before the start of the preseason. They're just all holed up in there. It's all about football. Sometimes they have a downtown location, but... They're trying to keep everybody focused. And yeah, a lot of the guys are here. I've heard that there's pretty good attendance at the OTAs. They're out up there working out before the on-field work starts. Handful of guys are still gone. You can kind of look at Instagram stories and kind of figure yeah. out yeah. who's <laughs> still working out somewhere else or on vacation. But hopefully when they start the on-field stuff, they have a better number this year. I know the team's expecting them to have a better number this year. So football is uh, just about here. It's interesting too for if you've ever been to like a college dorm or when you go to camps, <laughs> that's how I'm kind of envisioning it. It's yeah. just 60 to 70 guys, actually probably more than that, held up in one hotel. You see the buses roll in, pick them up, and then take them to practices. And we're, again, going to be out at OTAs uh, this coming Tuesday. We're excited about that. It's been a slow start uh, this off season. not a whole lot of breaking news. But we did see, courtesy of our buddy Brett Martell with the AP, that Cam Jordan is in contract extension talks. What do we know about that? Not a whole lot yet. Yeah, just his agent put his name on it, so that that's something. <laughs> yeah. Maybe a little bit of pressure on the team to try to get something done. But this wasn't like an anonymous, anonymously sourced mm -hmm. story. Doug Hendrickson said, hey, like we're working on this two-year deal right now. So it's something that I think would be beneficial for – all parties to get it done cam's getting a little bit older but mm -hmm. I, you know i just think it would feels right for him to maybe finish his career here it just is something that should happen it's one of those stories that you want to see play out that way so uh we'll see how it goes jordan and and his agent kind of approached things the same way the last time he had his extension too it was a year ahead of time they didn't want it to get down to crunch mm -hmm. time they didn't they don't want to explore free agency they want to you know, I mean, Cam has always hinted at it that, you know, I don't know if he really means it, but that he would leave if he had to. But this is where he belongs. This is where he should spend his whole career. He's he's kind of talked openly about how many more years he wants to have. I think he's thrown the number 37 and a half <laughs> out there before. He's uh, about to turn 34 years old. Um, so I think maybe one more contract, depending on the size of it, could be the last contract. But um, 
look, it's he's interesting because of his years of experience. Mm-hmm. He's probably not going to get paid like the highest end defensive end, but his production remains along with the best, and his importance to the team certainly does. I mean, they've tried replacing him a couple of times with uh, era parents and Marcus Davenport and Peyton Turner, and they didn't hit. And look, they just drafted Isaiah Foskey in the second round. He can be a mentor to him. Hopefully, he'll come along, but. Kim Jordan is as important to this roster yeah. right now as he's ever been. We, we've talked about uh, they needed the defensive line depth. That's one position where if Kim Jordan is not playing at his usual level or if he's hurt, which he hasn't been, uh, luckily for them in his career, uh, the drop-off behind him is substantial. I think there's three things, too. Number one, captain, voice in the locker room for several years. Two, he stayed healthy which is saying something on the Saints roster yeah. and the consistency. You look at his number breakdown and there hasn't been much drop off. And you can, it's actually probably fair to say in the last four years, he's had some of his best numbers in terms of sacks and passes defended and things like that. Let's take a look at some of the contracts and where they match up. We'll start with Cam Jordan. So he is ninth in the league right now in all uh, defensive ends at 17.5 million. Is that fair based on age consistency and just where he's at as a captain as well I think it's a it's a solid number for him maybe go up a little bit TJ Watt leads the league at 28 million there I don't think Cam's that type of player I do think that his numbers might actually get a little bit better this year with better players on the defensive line I think not having really any uh, interior push last year was something that probably set his numbers Mm -hmm. back a little bit and I think just having better guys coming off the edge helps as well so I think he's going to put up better sack numbers and everything but he is 34 years old I think he's giving up some of his leverage by trying to talk to the team early I don't think he's interested in being a top of the market guy I think Cam's at a point in his career where he just wants to be paid Mm -hmm. fairly and he wants to win football games and if he can sign for 18 million next time and that allows them to get a good defensive tackle that can help him get more sacks I think that's kind of where Cam's head's at I think he's been paid I think he has a very lucrative career waiting for him in the media world oh, sure. once it's over. So I don't think Cam's necessarily worried about getting every single dollar. He wants to be phase four of New Orleans <laughs> football. Right? It's a possibility. Uh, but phase look, four is on the way. You just have to look how he approached the last contract extension. Yeah. Exactly. They, they didn't turn this into a contentious thing. I don't remember there being a holdout. I don't remember him missing a day of off-season practices. And it was just the approach was, hey, this guy goes to the Pro Bowl every year. He's first or second team All Pro. Um, pay him, pay him something that's mm-hmm. respectful. And they did. And he did not become. He didn't set a new high bar for the defensive end position uh, when they did that. I think it was 2019 it, it, when when they did it last time. But it's like I belong in the top three, four, five. And they know, of course, two more young guys who are due up next are going to set the bar higher. The top five highest paid guys aren't usually the five best guys Mm -hmm. at any given position. They're the five guys whose contract came up most recently. And Cam is just like, don't let everybody, you know, just because they're in the fifth year of their deal, pass me up and make me be 15th or 20th on that list because he still ranks among you know, he's still a top 10 guy yeah. who, who's still competing for Pro Bowl spots every year. Let's look at this a little differently. So he is the fourth highest paid on the roster. You have Derek Carr at one, which makes sense. Yep. And then you have Marshall Lattimore second. I still think that makes sense, even though obviously he's been out with injury last majority of last year. Ramchek is third and then Cam is fourth. So that's, a, that's above Michael Thomas, that's above Alvin Kamara, that's above Eric McCoy, Demario Davis. Is it surprising when well, you look Michael at it from Thomas that Well, Michael Thomas began the yeah. calendar year above him, and they obviously right. worked out that pay cut. Um, and so, yeah, I do think it makes sense. I mean, the only one of that deal who it made sense at the time they signed it that hasn't quite lived up to it, I think, is Ryan Ramchek, mm-hmm. um, mostly because of injuries. Uh, he still has time to reestablish himself as – the top one or two right tackles in the league uh, unless, you know, injuries are, are going to – is this the new normal for Ryan Ramchek or the last two years of blip on the radar? That, that, that's pretty important for this team to find out. I think Ramchek's going to actually get better. I think the whole line will get better, though, with the quarterback mm-hmm. that can actually set protections now. That, that's a big deal, and it puts them in a better situation. The quarterback can see the field better. Jameis couldn't do that. Andy Dalton wasn't doing it last year. It fell on Eric McCoy. Eric McCoy misses games. They have a backup center in there. So I think with just someone that can command everything, mm-hmm. it, it works out a little bit better. I, it does make sense, though, to answer your question. I mean, the other guys that deserve to get paid are, are just younger. So, mm-hmm. like, Chris Olave is not in that conversation yet. Positional value isn't there at other positions. Kind of looking at some of these guys and where they're paid, 
illustrates maybe the thinness of the future a little bit too at some of these spots. Demario Davis is the other guy that I think could probably be paid more, and I think he has maybe the most friendly contract in the whole entire NFL, $9 million, perennial pro bowler and all pro player. Yeah. Top tier linebackers make $20 million. He's making nine. Like <laughs> That is an insane contract. He and might they proved the, that they want him because they let go of Kay Nellis. That yeah. adds to it. And he's re-signed. So like, he's just maybe another guy that's not out for every single dollar, but he is criminally underpaid, I think. One thing about Ryan Ramchek too, you mentioned being paid. He is, it, it's, crazy to me when you look at it that he has never been a pro bowler and we're going to get into that uh down the road but that was the biggest surprise to me another big surprise when you look at this breakdown and we're going to have a visual for th- for you guys on that michael thomas and Taysom hill are both paid the same from michael thomas's pay cut is that <laughs> i mean i know their how contracts I feel about look that. a lot different i mean Taysom yeah. hill Incentives makes 10 million a year michael thomas could be as low as what eight, as high as fifteen, or whatever you know, because the breakdown, it's not yeah. But yeah, that is an that is an <laughs> interesting uh, number. Look, I mean, Taysom Hill got overpaid. Uh, for how they ended up using him. But right. he's a unicorn, so I guess his deal had to look like a unicorn. Um, uh, the, the one irony, we have talked about this on the show before, for all the things that people did not like uh, about their offense last year, fairly, and Pete Carmichael Jr. is the first to admit that he didn't do the best job he could in a lot of ways. I think they probably used Taysom Hill better last year than mm-hmm. they even were when when his godfather, Sean Payton, was the head coach <laughs> of this team. And I hope they continue to build off that and continue to use him in the right way. Do you feel like they maybe, before we move on, do you feel like maybe they forgot about Taysom Hill in some games, Mike? Oh, of course. Yeah. I mean, every time he did something well, it was like, why don't you do that more often? Oh, yeah, we should. You know. <laughs> before yeah. we move on, I, I got to hear the words that go with that facial expression. With? With yours. Okay. And I, and I say this. Number one, Taysom Hill, there's not, there's, I mean, he is unique in what he is doing, and we've seen other teams try to replicate that. I know you mentioned a few shows ago with Jalen Hurts. Well, he's in his own <laughs> lane. Obviously, as a starting quarterback, Taysom is not. But what Taysom can do and bring to a team, and what we saw when Sean Payton was still here, incredibly valuable. But if you're not using him in that right. way, I don't see him having the same value that a Michael Thomas has. Now, if Michael Thomas comes out and is the Michael Thomas of old, mm-hmm. pay him whatever you want. I mean, he he deserves all of that. But it is kind of glaring to see those two take out the incentives and everything like that, that they are both making $10 million at yeah. the same time. Yeah. I mean, the Taysom contract was a little crazy yes. at the time. I think it's still a little bit crazy. <laughs> They've underused them for what they're paying Absolutely. them. Absolutely. I can get the theoretical value if he's – living up to everything yes. but they gotta they gotta yeah they gotta put him in better positions to succeed to to make sure he makes that time and it wasn't dollars. even that he was the backup quarterback role like we saw when it was trevor simeon like they kind of held on to taste him mm-hmm. a little bit and that's why we didn't see a lot of him you know two years ago but last year he was never really in that backup quarterback role so what happened yeah. well you know why wasn't he being used well i talked to pete carmichael about that the other day and i said what's interesting is they might have had a vision for him being uh-huh. more of a tight end on this team last year um, because that was a need that they had. But as the season wore on and they had the attrition at the running back position and Jameis Winston got hurt, they went right back to using Taysom Hill the way they've always used him and using him more than ever. It, you know, however many – there were some games where he was getting 15, 18 snaps at quarterback. Um, you know, a couple games he was the he was the NFC Offensive Player of the Week one week when they, when they beat the Seahawks, if I remember. Um, huge part of their rushing game but barely used at all as a tight end they threw that out the window last mm-hmm. year this year i said to Pete carmichael i said now you have depth at quarterback you've got Derek carr and james winston you've got depth at running back you had jamal williams and kendra miller two alvin Kamara. where where does Taysom hill fit and and they've said they want to keep using him the way they've always used him but Pete carmichael said i need to do a better job of remembering yeah. that he could be a part of the tight end wide receiver passing game game plan. Easier said than done, obviously, because they didn't do it last year. He, he's paid too much. He's like paid to be a, a running back at $10 million a year, and he's not a $10 million running back. So they got to figure something out there. Well, we'll see it soon enough. Season's not too far away. We'll see how they either utilize him in the same way they did last year or maybe a few years ago. So one thing, too, we mentioned Marshawn Lattimore, you know, second highest paid guy on the team at 19.4 million. That's actually he's not even the highest paid cornerback. He's the fifth highest paid cornerback in the NFL. Does that number go up if he returns back to what he was prior to getting injured? Yeah, he's young. So when his contract expires, he's probably going to be setting the market again. So. 
Yeah, that number is definitely going to go up. Jalen Ramsey, I think, is the number one guy right now in terms of uh, salary. If, if Lattimore is healthy, though, and mm-hmm. he's locked in and he's playing well and he's committed and all that stuff, definitely goes to the top of the market. And if he doesn't, he's still going to be top two or three guy in the league, I think. And if he does play, I do expect him to be there. We saw some growth like in his maturity and how he approaches everything over the last couple of years. I know last year he had the kidney injury and there was some stuff whispered behind the scenes about maybe the timeline on coming back and some frustration on both sides of that situation. But I think they got him back into the fold late last season. Lattimore was bought back in. So I think it's going to be all good going forward. And if he's healthy, I I don't see any reason why he wouldn't be near the top. But he should be the highest paid guy on this team. I know the quarterback obviously is, but out of everybody else, he should be because I think he's the most talented player on the roster. Somebody who used to be the highest paid kicker is no more, right, with Will Lutz? Highest paid kicker here. (laughs) (laughs) But let's get into, because we're going to add in Will Lutz to the show in a little bit. Why does that make sense, the pay cut? Well, he's at a little bit of a career crossroads mm-hmm. right now. When when he was briefly the highest paid kicker in in one capacity, I don't remember if it was total value or if it was average per year, but, but then he got passed up soon after. But he had earned that. I mean, he was legitimately a top three kicker maybe in the NFL at his peak, but then he misses an entire season due to injury. And then he comes back and, and shows more inconsistency than we ever saw from him before. And it's a what have you done for me lately league. It's mm-hmm. a what have you done for me lately position. And he knows that. He's well aware of it. One of the most interesting answers in this interview we're going to get to is his reaction when I asked him about, I don't think I've ever seen three kickers yeah. in camp at, at once before. Um, with the two, with the two like undrafted rookies that he's competing against right now, and he takes that personally. He's like, he doesn't like walking in the room and seeing, seeing three kickers in that room. Uh, but he knows that he he earned his way into this spot, and so he agreed to that pay cut with the Saints because he wants to be here, um, and, and he recognizes the reality of his situation. But I think he quickly wants to go back to all right now, pay me what I'm worth again mm-hmm. if he can show what he's worth again. I've been humbled and humiliated, so I have nothing bad. <laughs> Well, we are going to head out, actually, to the Saints practice facility. Thank you to the Saints for allowing us to come out there. Things went a little bit sideways. And <laughs> you talking about Nick's kick? Or? Well, more I, so my, why, <laughs> why these two. These two were not supposed to kick. They were champs. I was only able to kick one extra point. We're not going to explain why here. We're going to explain at a later date. You might see me walking around with a limp for a little bit, but we're fine. Just on IR for a little bit. And we are going to have a redemption video. Oh, I'm getting my shake back. Oh, oh, it's happening. It's happening. See, I should have kicked twice. My biggest mistake is I didn't kick twice. The second one would have been good. My approach looked good. But you guys in, and I appreciate that. And mm. let, let's just let the video talk for itself. I don't want to. Let's talk a little football first. The schedule came out last week, and and we always think of things like, ah, Green Bay, they're playing early in the season, no cold weather, New England, no cold weather, like 13 or 14 indoor games. Is is this great for you, or do you want variety? Do you want a challenge? I don't jinx this. New England, what's that, October, (laughs) can get a little dicey. But um, obviously when you see Green Bay in September, I guess, that's a huge win. So we're happy about that. That's a great stadium to play in that time of year. So. Not only from a weather standpoint, but from a game day experience, it'll be a good one. Give me your favorite place to kick outside, outdoors, and Oof. and the most harrowing. Honestly, early season Green Bay is a lot of fun to kick in. Uh, just a really cool stadium. Um, I've had my tough goes in Chicago. Most people have. So that would have to be bottom of the list. But um, and I guess Cleveland negative 21 wind chill wasn't fun either. But, <laughs> uh, Green Bay is really cool. Vegas was a really cool experience. The ball flies a little bit out there. So. When you're looking at some of those games, like New England, they have that open end where the wind can kind of come in. Like, are those things you're considering as you're looking at the schedule? And is that something uh, you adjust to before the game? We, maybe we try not to think too much ahead. I mean, you don't want to let the kind of the atmosphere of a stadium affect you the week before. But um, I mean, that's the the job of pregame: figure out how that wind's coming in. And New England being one with a huge open end. Um, Pittsburgh this past season was a tough one coming off the river there. But that's what pregame's for. You know, if you Look at the weather for the day before, the day after. It doesn't help yeah. your kicking, you know. How do you approach that? Is it like you see people on a golf course pick up the grass and drop it and see where the wind? Like, what is the approach compared from indoor and outdoor, and how you factor in weather? Yeah, obviously it's similar. We, you know, try to pick up the wind direction, but um, the biggest thing with kicking is figuring out your ball contact is going to defeat that wind that day. So 
you know, you kind of go through warm-ups and whatever your ball's doing, you just got to trust. You know, for example, Pittsburgh this year felt like this huge crosswind. Mm -hmm. And anytime you play that wind, we'd miss. But if you just hit a straight ball, it'd go in. So, you know, if you throw up a piece of grass on that one, you're going to think you got to aim left. The ball's going to move right. But with the way the wind comes in these stadiums, it can really do anything. So you really judge it off your ball flight during warm-ups and kind of go with your gut and trust that the ball contact's going to do the same in the game. Is that frequent when you have to trust your gut on some of these <laughs> kicks? or Because some people are thinking, you know, it's the analytics, it's physics, it's things like that. But you've been in the league long enough. Is it maybe a gut check on some of those kicks? Absolutely. Um, you got to go out there with conviction and know that whatever you were doing in pregame and really throughout the year is going to continue to work. Um, the minute you start second-guessing yourself, you can get kind of a bad patch of, of games like, unfortunately, we had this year. But, um, you know, that's just part of the business. And, mm -hmm. you know, you're out, you're on the field for about 15 seconds, and that wind can change in that 15 seconds. So you got to pick your spot and you got to go for it. And um, that's kind of what I tell younger kids. Pick your target and hit it. Well, obviously, it's no secret you're coming off toughest two-year stretch of your career, missing the entire season with injury, never dealt with that before. Mm -hmm. And then you know, more misses last year than before. How do you deal with it? Have you changed your approach at all? Have you tried not to change your approach? Uh, it's just kind of resetting, to be honest, kind of back to the drawing board. Um, I had a really good five-year stretch here that I was really proud of. And, you know, coming off an injury like that, unfortunately, I think physically I felt great. Mentally was the hard part, right? When you, I'll never forget Atlanta first game of the year. It was like deer in the headlights. Felt like in my rookie year again when you miss a full year like that. So. Man, it's really just kind of reset and figure out um, what I can do better, um, continue to build strength. I feel as strong as ever. So kind of just trying to grow off this offseason. It's the first full offseason I've had in two years. So I'm, I'm pretty fired up about that. And uh, my operations as good as they've ever been right now. So, you know, obviously my goal is to bounce back from that. I made some big kicks last year, but unfortunately I missed some that I usually don't miss. So, um, yeah, we're going to build off the offseason and try to turn this thing around. I'm not sure I've ever seen – the Saints with three kickers in camp. I mean, that, that's a glaring signal. It's always competition, but that, that there's competition, right? Yeah, I mean, that, look, that's frustrating in my position, right? I've been here seven years and walk in the building and you're in a meeting room with two other kickers. is It's a little bit of a gut punch, but look, it's a business and um, the team has the right to do whatever they want to do and it uh, fires me up, a little chip on my shoulder and like I said, try to turn this thing around. Did you ever feel like yourself last year? Was it a process of like just getting used to it, and then as the season went, did you feel better? Like, how, how did you kind of feel? Going you know, it, it was it was tough because I had arguably my best training camp I've had all year. I think I missed two kicks and yeah. out of seventy five or something like that. Like I, I felt really dialed in, and like I said, that first week it was just like kind of a curveball. I hadn't been in a stadium with fans in in three years. Right, my last mm -hmm. season before the injury was COVID, and there was no fans, so it was really eye opening, and it took a lot of time to get adjusted and. Um, like I said, I hit some balls that I know I was capable of. Um, hit some big kicks that year. I made every extra point. I mean, that's something to be proud of. But unfortunately, we missed the shoot. It was 37-yarder in Vegas. We had a 31-yarder in Carolina blocked. You take those two kicks out, and it's a new season. So it's those kicks i got to get out and, uh, you know, make the kicks that I know I've made here for a long time. Obviously, you reworked your, your contract this offseason. What was that process just kind of like, and why were you agreeable to it? Look, it's, this is home for me. Uh, I'm not from here, but I've kind of made it home, and this is where I want to be. Um, I said when I signed here my rookie year that I was going to end the carousel, and then when I signed my extension in 2018, I guess, I said I want to catch Morton Anderson. So we're a little past halfway now, so I got to – obviously, I got a few more years to go on that. So, you know, that's my goal. I'm not going to let one bad year – run me out of this place and um, obviously that it starts up top they got to want me back at least a little bit so I'm excited that they were willing to, to work with me and um, you know with the way this contract is structured I'm kind of excited to see where it goes. I wanted to ask you about that London kick I think we all think about that one. Yeah <laughs> every other night. <laughs> every, yeah I mean tell us about it what was the approach there and what was it, 60 something yards? That yeah, it so we hit a 60 yarder going in and then um, 61 about a minute and 20 seconds later. Um, I hit both those balls as good as I've ever hit a football. So the 60 was good from 67, and the 61, if it was straight, would have been probably good from 67. So that was a heartbreaker. Um, obviously, that's the highs and lows of a kicker, right? Yeah. You know, whether it's coming off a miss and having to make a kick two minutes later 
we're coming off such a big kick that keeps us in the game, thinking, oh my gosh, I just joined the 60-yard club for the first time in my career. And then I remember I came off the sidelines and I jokingly looked at Zach Wood and Blake and said, oh, we're going to hit 61 yarder to win the game. Uh, just like kind of joking about that I just hit my first 60 yarder. And sure enough, it happens. And man, I, like I said, I hit it as good as I could. And it's one of those kicks that you just kind of live with, yeah. unfortunately. Um, I gave it a ride and I'm really not sure how that ball didn't rotate forward. I've watched that film in slow-mo a hundred times, but you know, it's part of the business. I know a lot of coaches like to leave kickers alone too, especially after that. You don't typically see a head coach like run after you and like try to have a conversation with you. But we have seen in recent years, like some coaches, especially when you guys, when you were out and some of the new kickers were in, you'll see sometimes a head coach like tee up next to a kicker, like this is what you should have done differently. <laughs> Obviously, that's not your special teams coach. How do you yeah. guys handle that when like, you're having conversations with head coaches who typically aren't specialists, and you're trying to explain to them, like, hey, look, just sometimes it doesn't go our way, right? Yeah, you know, every coach is different. Um, you know, Coach Allen does a good job, kind of just let me work. Um, we're all pros, you know. I've been, yeah. This is just finished my seventh year. You know, I know how to handle a miss or make, so I think – when the coach knows that there's a veteran kicker, I says kicker, you know, it's different. Um, you know, if there's a rookie, we might give him some words of encouragement or something like that. But at the end of the day, we're all pros, and it's just kind of like, hey, let's just just work through this and figure it out on figure it out on our own. A few things people might never think of with a kicker is that you're off day to day, which is one thing they might never think of. Like we talked to you about this, and you're like, can't kick that day. That's a yeah. non-kicking day for me. But you're you're not wearing the shoes you would kick in. A lot of kickers, I remember John Carney squeezed into a shoe that was yep. like three or four sizes. His, his kicking foot was in a shoe. A lot of kickers, way smaller. What, what's your approach? What are your yeah, shoes? Yeah, that's pretty general around the league. Yeah. Um, not to make it scientific, but surface area is <laughs> yeah. everything, right? If you don't want any any space between your skin and the, the uh, leather on, the, on your shoe so that you can compress that ball 100%. Um, so, yeah, I wear a full-size smaller on my right. And because of that, I wear a football cleat on my left just because no reason for my left foot to be uncomfortable. So I wear my normal size shoe on my left and um, full size smaller on my right. And we're holding the K-ball. Um, this yep. has been around ever since, even when you started college? Did you guys have K-balls? It's kind of changed. So in college, we did not, and still in college, you use whatever balls are, yeah. um, the quarterbacks are using. Um, in the NFL, it's kind of changed over the years. Used, before I was here, it was fresh out of the box. Yeah. And then a lot of guys obviously didn't like that. Um, but now it's we get an hour to break them in before the game. Not us, the equipment guys. We're not allowed to touch the ball until the opening kickoff. Um, but as you can see, I mean, the difference is our uh, K-ball guys, their job is to eliminate the nubs, mm. make the ball as fat as possible, kind of flatten these seams for aerodynamics. And then the guys who do the quarterback balls, they want to enhance those nubs, shrink the ball, because yeah. you know, they're trying to wrap a hand around it. We're trying to enhance that sweet spot. So it's like inflate gate, basically. One, yeah, exactly. Now, so we don't get in trouble. It is the same PSI as the Kobe Bowl. But, yeah. Um, yeah, we just try to make it fly a little better. And, uh, I mean, for example, K-Bowl, you, you know, I can hit from 64, 65 yards, and that same that same day I'll tee up a QB ball and I might get 52 yards out mm. of it. Are you going through so, checking them then? Like when they're done with that process, are you picking out your – Um, You know, they've got it, They've become a little more lenient. They used to not let us see the ball until opening kickoff. Like I'd go out and I'd, the, ball would, the, the official would hand me the ball and I'd be like, all right, it's a pretty good one. But now, you know, our our um, EQ guys, they'll walk through and just say, hey, you want which one do you want to be ball one, which one do you want to be ball two? And we'll just kind of compare, say ball one, ball two. So that's the first time we see him now. You better start working with um, this. We're not allowed to kick him until we <laughs> kick off. Yeah, that's where we're headed. I'm going to go change into some cleats so I don't embarrass myself and slide off this turf, but let's get to it. All right, let's do it. Brooke, we got a little bit of a challenge today. We're on arena uprights. Okay. So we're putting you to work early. Uh, so just some basic mechanics of kicking. Uh, most people think it's a big run up. It's three steps back, two steps over. Um, put your non-dominant foot forward, which you call that your jab step. And then um, you're kicking like back a little. And then it's just kind of swing away. <laughs> Sweet spot on the football is right around here. Okay. You hit. It's what's going to give you that end over end rotation. 
Um, avoid laces at all costs. Why do the laces have to be out? So just like I stated on the, on the QB ball, there's a dead spot on K balls as well, and they're usually about right here. And so we're trying to kick the ball right there. So when you okay. get laces, laces to you, there's a dead spot there, and the ball's just not going to travel as far. If you hit higher on the ball, that's when you get the wide left, wide right. Your foot grabs the laces and turns it, and that's when it kind of will spiral one of the ways, depending on which way you're going. But that is a curse. But I'm kicking a ball in, typically on a soccer field. I'm as back far as I can. So it's just to catch your momentum going forward. So to demonstrate it, like my, my stance is here. So it's small. Like I said, there's finesse involved in a field goal. See, it's not all power. It's all hitting the sweet spot of the football. And you're going to hit that spot with a little bone on your foot right there, similar to a soccer ball. Okay. I think what we learned here today is that when you miss a kick, we are not going to say anything about it. <laughs>